Okay. Okay. Good morning in America and good afternoon in Europe. Uh, only a few words for welcoming all of you uh, to this new activity organized by IFIL. Uh, from IFIL is an honor and a very great satisfaction to be able to conclude our season of activities with the presentation of this uh, marvelous book, original from the title. And of course, it's, it is a privilege for us that uh, Mike Keen and Joel Slenroth uh, be here to talk with uh, us uh, about the book, the history of fiscal affairs and the present and the future of uh, public finance. Uh, when all of you buy the book, uh, obviously you, you must do it uh, all uh, quickly, eh? speedy. Eh? Uh, and, when, and when you read uh, this book, uh, you will find a delicious collection of historical events with tax explanations or tax implication from which necessarily you are going to improve your knowledge of public uh, affairs. I kindly welcome to, uh, to you to, to, to this your home, the Ibero-American Association of Local Financing. Uh, I thank you very much. Uh, you will spend a piece of your time uh, sharing with us your, your knowledge. Uh, I have no doubt uh, that um, we are going to have fun over the next time and that uh, we will uh, will learn learning while enjoying. Uh, I give the floor to our colleague uh, and outstanding member of IFIL, uh, Juan Pablo Jimenez, uh, who will chair the decision. And by my, uh, myself, uh, only uh, reiterate the acknowledge. Uh, thank you very much. Juan Pablo. Thank, you. thank you, Javier. Eh, bueno, eh, buenos días eh, for everybody. <laughs> buenos días. Good morning, good morning for, to everyone. And, uh, and good afternoon uh, in, in Europe. It is a pleasure for, I feel, our association to have today the presentation of this excellent book uh, by its authors, probably the most eminent thinkers of tax issues today, both in their theoretical and political aspects. In their new book that has the suggestive title of Rebellion, Rascals and Revenues, Tax Follies and Wisdom Through the Ages, Michael Keane and Joel Slenron offer us a journey through the history of taxation, showing us that their review can be entertaining as well as educational to understand our tax problems. The journey they propose in the book goes According to Professor Richard Burr, essential review of the book, unfortunately, one of his last writings before his recent death, the history of taxation resembles the warehouse in the final scene of the film Raiders of the Lost Ark, a huge misled shambo of un unlabeled boxes, one of which may be hiding the answer of all the world fiscal problems. In this book, the, the authors turn on the lights of the warehouse, organize many of the boxes in an enlightened way, and present the results with a style that make the subject not only understandable, but, and this can be a surprise to many of us, really, is really fun to read. The book is divided into five parts, composed by of uh, 15 chapters. Part one, Plunder of Power, presents the general scenario, presenting some episodes in the history of taxation, and some of the main and perennial tax truths and the way in which governments took care of, of making the taxpayer pay in order to finance their activities and some of their fantasies too. The second part about winners and losses is about fair taxation. This issue is central to taxmen 
and about which they have to be very careful if they, if, if they want to survive in office. We, in our region, have some examples of what <laughs> happens if you don't, if you don't take care about the, this, these issues. As the, book, as the book review in detail, it is not easy to determine when, who wins and who loses in the face of a tax change. The question of who exactly suffers from the tax burden is something that has been in the debate since middle age and has shaped our current institutions. The third part of the book is about how human intelligence has been used to evade taxes and how governments have dealt with that. The fourth part deal with reviewing the art of tax collection, which show us the worst and the best of the human nature and the ways government have found to seduce or threaten taxpayers to pay, to pay their taxes. The last part is about the different realities of tax policy and there's still some lessons to consider in the future of, of taxation. As the authors make clear, this is not a history book of taxation and it is not a handbook of, on the principles of taxation, but it's a great contribution in both directions. The principles of taxation give framework to history, which allow us to understand how the authority of the past, without counting on anything like current taxes or, 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 or current information or data, inventing other ways to, to raise revenues and mitigate the tax burden on the poorest. History collaborates to clarify the principle of taxation. For those looking for an organization closer to public finance, there's a lot of public finances professors in our association. The five part contains equity topics, vertical and horizontal, incidence analysis, efficiency issues and optimal taxation, practical economic policy topics, and tax challenges and policies and possibilities, sorry, for the future. But today we are lucky. And this morning we have the possibility to have the authors with us. Uh, and it will be a pleasure to hear them to tell us, uh, uh, to, to tell us a little about this fascinating book. Uh, once they are, once they, they finish with their presentation, we will open the floor to receive the questions. Maybe the 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 the, 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 the easiest way is please uh, send a, send the chat. Please use the chat to 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 to, to your questions. And before I pass the, the Zoom to the authors, let me introduce them. Although you are surely familiar with the with them, Michael King is a is a is a deputy director of the fiscal affairs department at the IMF. Before joining the fund, he was professor of economics at the University of Essex and visiting professor at Queen's University in Canada and Kyoto University in Japan. He's the co-author of books on the modern BAT uh, and taxing profits in global economy. He is co he's a co-author co uh, on, uh, on books as Digital Revolution in Public Finance, Inequality and Fiscal Policy, Mitigate Climate Change, and others, on, and others on the taxation of petroleum and minerals, custom administrations, labor market institutions. Michael was president of the International Institute of Public Finance. He was awarded uh, by the uh, Mass Gray Prize in 2010, and in 2018 received from the National Tax Association its most prestigious award, the Daniel Holland Medal for Distinguished lifetime contribution to the study and practice of public finance. He's the co-founding co co-editor of International Tax and Public Finance. He served as associate editor of the Review of Economic Studies and on the editorial boards of the Journal of Public Economics, American Economic Journal, Economic Policy, Economic Policy, and many other journals. Joel Slamrock, is professor of business economics and public policy at the Stephen Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan and professor of economics in the Department of Economics. He also serves as director of the Office of Tax Policy Research and Interdisciplinary Research Center. He's the author of several books 
among them taxing ourselves, uh, uh, which has gone through uh, five editions and has been translated into Chinese and, Jap and Japanese, tax systems, uh, taxes in America, and well, most recently, this book with Michael Kim. Slamrod was the president of the National Tax Association and was also the president of the International Institute of Public Finance. In 2012, he received two, he received also the National Tax Association, from the National Tax Association, its most pre prestigious award, the Daniel Holland Medal, as, 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 as Michael. From 1992 to 1998, Slamrod was editor of the National Tax Journal and co-editor of the Journal of Public Economics. Um, Michael, so this is, I, 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 I can imagine a better, a better uh, present, uh, present uh, it's, it's a, a better uh, authors today to, 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 to present this, these topics. Uh, Michael, Joel, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much to be here. Well, thank you, Buenos dias. It's, um, it's a great pleasure for us both to be here. Thanks, uh, Juan Pablo, for inviting us. And thanks, uh, Javier and Juan Pablo, for the very generous, kind introduction. Uh, it was a great summary of the book. And um, you know, thanks for mentioning Richard Bird's review. It was um, just sad to think of Richard, but it's, uh, it was a characteristically brilliant um, analogy he gave that you mentioned in the, the uh, last scene of um, uh, the movie. So, okay, so Joel and I, very happy to be here. We're going to go backwards and forwards a little bit on presenting the book for 45, 50 minutes or so. And uh, so Joel's going to uh, share the screen with the presentation and we'll be doing the, the clicking, but maybe just to start, it might help to, um, uh, to explain the origin of the book. So really what happened was that um, many years ago, Joel and I discovered that we had a shared interest in kind of weird, uh, interesting, bizarre tax stories. So for many years, we would share stories. Uh, and eventually, my, it was my partner, Geraldine, suggested, well, why don't you guys write a book? You have so many great stories. Why not write a book? And it occurred to us that, yeah, we could, we could write a book. But what we tried to do is really not just have a kind of um, an unconnected series of entertaining stories fun though that would be. But what we realized was that all these stories um, we could use to illustrate some basic principles of taxation. So exactly as Javier said, the idea is that we could use these stories for people to learn about taxes, um, but in a, in a pleasant, uh, fairly easygoing kind of, uh, kind of way. So that's what we try to do. Uh, we try to use these historical episodes to illustrate an entertaining way, basic principles of taxation. And what really allows us to do that, I think as Juan Pablo was, was hinting, is that um, really there are some, some common themes that really run through the history of taxation. Governments have tried to raise the revenue they need in a way that um, doesn't lead to rebellion and revolt, even if they don't care about fairness themselves, they want to make sure that their own regime is, is secure. They want to raise revenue in ways that don't unduly uh, damage economic activity. They don't want to raise revenue uh, in a way that actually destroys the tax base. <clears throat> what does change is the technology that's been available to them to do this. Um, but the central theme, as we see here, is the central tax challenges haven't really changed that much over the millennia. And when we sort of isolate these common challenges, we can see, I think, how taxation develops and maybe uh, helps us to uh, address some of the issues that we all see coming in the in the near future. So book is supposed to be more than just fun tax stories um, and pictures. <clears throat> we try to have quite a few pictures in the book, which is not usual for taxation, but we actually think that um, sometimes uh, <clears throat> photographs and images can convey basic tax principles better than complicated diagrams can. Um, but there are certainly plenty of fun stories. And some of the stories we should say in the book um, are just entertaining. There's no real tax lesson of any significance at all that we know of. They're just kind of interesting stories. 
And in making these things fun, of course, we're hoping to engage a wide audience, maybe people who just have an interest in history, but like to learn a bit more about text. But I think as, uh, as Juan Pablo was saying, I think we also see this as a book that can help people who are teaching public finance, because strangely, there are some weird people out there who don't necessarily find the theory of public finance and taxation rivetingly interesting, but we think it, this can help to, to make uh, courses maybe a little bit more, more lively. So here's the structure of the book, which I won't go through in detail as one published very uh, accurately and ably described it, just to make the point that really, although we don't um, stress this in how we present the book, it very much follows a, a kind of a standard public finance text approach. <clears throat> So introduction, motivation, talk about fairness, talk about behavioral impact of taxes, excess burden, turn a bit to administration, and then turn to policy making. And we end the book with, uh, with 11 general principles of, uh, of tax policy, of tax administration and tax policy. So I'm gonna start things off by talking about um, the first section, which as Juan Pablo says is called plunder and power. And is partly trying to get people to understand really the importance of taxation and how it shapes our, how it shapes our lives. <clears throat> so we start with a couple of stories. Um, we, don't, um, you know, we don't think that taxation explains everything in history. There are people who believe that President Kennedy was assassinated because he was going to close up a loophole in the taxation of the gas and oil industry. We don't necessarily believe that. Tax doesn't explain everything, but it does explain a lot. And here are a couple of examples. So the, the story on the left, um, there may well be people in the audience who know this story better than me, better than we do, and can correct us. But this is the one war that we can put our finger on and say that war was really triggered by a tax dispute. And this is the 10 cents war. I think it was 1879 to 84 that pitched um, Bolivia and Peru on one hand against Chile on the other. So this was a, a war that was, and you can see it was a, re it's a really bloody, as you know, very real, bloody, unpleasant war. And what was the tax story there? Well, the tax story there was that the province, I think, of, of Atacama uh, was um, Bolivian at the, in the mid 19th century, but it was not an area that people really greatly cared about. But then of course, uh, nitrates and guano were discovered and Bolivia then uh, imposed an export charge on a bunch of Chilean companies that were doing business uh, in, in, in the region. And you can see what's, what's going to happen, what's coming. There was a fiscal stability clause in the, in the agreement, which said that the tax would not be raised for, I, can't, I can never remember, 10, 15 years. But then Bolivia did raise the tax, needed the revenue, raised the tax, which prompted uh, the invasion by Chile. Peru then, our understanding has had a secret treaty with Bolivia, came into the war and, and on Bolivia's side. In the end, uh, Chile was victorious, took over the territory. Um, and this became um, really why, in our understanding, why Bolivia is landlocked because of the loss of this province, which was still uh, a running dispute, a very much a sore point, even I think a couple of years ago there were, um, uh, the, the court, the case came to the International Court of Justice. And our further understanding, where please of course correct us if we're wrong on any of these things, is that in Bolivia, the annual Miss Bolivia contest still has a representative from this missing province, uh, Atacama. So this is an example where taxation may not, um, uh, you know, change the uh, change the world in in all respects, but it may change the map of the world um, through the impact, for example, on Bolivia. The other story will be a story you're probably familiar with, <clears throat> except many people are more familiar with the myth of the Boston Tea Party than with the reality. So the myth is that the Boston Tea Party was prompted by the British, then the colonial power, imposing or raising taxes on tea levied on uh, coming into the colonies, which the American colonists then objected to and uh, in protest threw the tea into Boston Harbor. Well, the reality is a little bit different. What really happened was that um, the British had a big problem at the time with the East India Company, which was uh, really the Facebook, the Google, uh, Amazon of, of the time all rolled into one, huge, hugely powerful multinational. 
And this was essentially um, had interest both in, in India and in America. By the late 1760s, things were going badly wrong for the East India Company. There was a famine in India that diminished their revenues in India. There was a boycott of tea, uh, a limited boycott of tea in the American colonies. And so the, the East India Company was in big financial trouble, had a lot of unsold tea. So the question was, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to restore the, uh, the East India Company? And you know, a lot of members of parliament were major shareholders in the East India Company, very, very influential. Well, what happened was some uh, clever bureaucrat realized, well, hang on, we have tea that goes to the colonies, and when the tea arrives in the Americas, it pays a tax, three pence uh, a pound, and we don't want to change that tax because that tax is there as a matter of principle. That tax is not there to raise revenue. It's there to show that if we want to tax the American colonists, we can. So that tax was kind of fixed. But the clever bureaucrat noticed there's another tax. There's a tax that's paid on the tea in London before it gets shipped to the colonists. So why don't we cut the tax on the tea when it comes through uh, London? Basically, we have a drawback scheme. We're having a drawback for the tea that's, that's um, uh, re-exported to, 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 uh, to the United, to, to the colonies. So the idea was, hang on, this is pretty brilliant. We can cut the tax on tea in London. We keep the tax that's levied when the tea arrives in the colonies unchanged. But because of this tax cut, we can, uh, we can reduce the price of tea in America, in the Americas, everybody's going to buy more tea, East India Company's going to do well, everyone's going to be happy. So it was kind of a brilliant scheme, always seems to be the kind of scheme some brilliant um, person at the IMF would have thought of. But what went wrong? What could possibly go wrong? Well, what went wrong was that by cutting the price of tea, we were going to undercut the smugglers in Boston, who were smuggling in uh, tea, avoiding the British tax, and these smugglers were very influential people. They were people like John Hancock, the famous uh, signatory of the um, uh, Declaration of Independence. And essentially, by cutting the, the tax of tea, we took on these powerful interest groups. There were other aspects that were going on at the same time. But essentially, we were getting ourselves into trouble again by taking on too powerful a lobby group. But the story is that it wasn't a tax increase that led to the Boston Tea Party. It was actually a tax cut which makes uh, you know, the, the name and, uh, of the Tea Party now in the United States somewhat ironic, since it was a tax cut that caused the Boston Tea Party in the first place. So moving on, so we've, we're telling these stories to, to persuade people that tax really matters, and that sometimes uh, we have to be a little bit careful uh, in, in believing what people tell us about taxation. And we go on from there, I believe, uh, Joel, to uh, talk about name. I think you wanted to do the names, no, Joel? Or do I do okay. that? <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks, Mick. Um, hablo Espanol, uh, por supuesto. Pero uh, I feel more comfortable speaking in English, so I will speak in English uh, this morning. Uh, and thanks uh, for inviting us and to give us the opportunity to talk about our book. Um, so after the, an introduction, we talk about um, names, taxes have been given uh, sometimes to attract supporters, sometimes to attract uh, opposition, sometimes to make taxes seem like less of a burden, they're named after what they fund uh, rather than what, they're, what the tax base is. So, and there's some... Uh, pretty interesting names that people have given taxes in the UK. Uh, um, people against the tax came to call it the dementia tax. It was not a tax on dementia. There was the Bridget Jones tax. In the US, one of the more successful attempts to uh, rename at least uh, colloquially a tax is when Republicans a couple decades ago uh, agreed among themselves to no longer call the estate and gift tax, the estate and gift tax, they said, well, from now on, we're gonna call it the death tax. That makes it sound uh, pretty bad, even though if you look at the details of the tax, death is neither necessary nor sufficient uh, to trigger a tax liability. It's not sufficient because there's a very large exemption. Most 
people are not subject to the tax. It's not necessary because it is an estate and gift tax. You uh, can be liable to tax if you have uh, given gifts during your lifetime. Uh, as you all know, uh, governments can raise resources in many ways not called taxes, and they historically have used all of these methods. The draft, of course, is a way of getting resources, printing money, profitable state monopolies, forced labor. And um, as uh, has been mentioned, the book has many, many examples from South America and Latin America. We have a story how um, in the Incan civilization uh, for provinces, I think the story was for provinces that did not have a, a substantial real liability, they were required to remit taxes in lice just to make the point that um, taxes could be due and in principle were due. Um, one of our favorite examples is um, shown in this picture. This is of course Elvis Presley, who I presume is wildly popular in South America and Latin America as he is in the United States. This is a Elvis Presley on a postage stamp of the African country uh, of Burkina Faso. And I know some of you are now thinking, what does this have to do with taxes and the name of taxes? And the answer is that Putting Elvis, uh, Burkina Faso, putting Elvis on their postage stamps is a way for that country to raise revenue. It's called the commercialization of state sovereignty when countries use the fact that they are countries to raise revenue. One way to do that is to put popular figures and images on postage stamps, even if those postage stamps actually never come to the country. Collectors want them. And they want them if people like Elvis or Lady Dyer on the postage stamp. Well, this is sort of like being a tax haven. Certain countries, often countries that don't have a lot going for them economically, become tax havens. You can't do that if you're not a country. So that's another example of the commercialization of state sovereignty. Mick and I would like to uh, make money by issuing postage stamps, but nobody would buy them we might consider becoming tax havens, but it wouldn't work. You have to be a country. And um, so issuing postage stamps, becoming a tax haven is a way of commercializing state sovereignty and raising revenue, not from taxes. The second part of the book is about fairness and incidents. And um, I think Mick, this is back to you. It is. It is. Yep. Thanks, Joel. Yeah. So, in terms of uh, as we said at the um, at, uh, at the outset, one of the common themes in taxation, of course, is the efforts to be kind of reasonably fair, and that's the case even for despots who really don't care intrinsically about fairness, but they have to worry about the perceptions of fairness of others because they want the tax system not to be seen as so unjust that their own positions become untenable. And of course, history is full of examples of taxation playing an important role in revolt and rebellion in uh, Americas, in my own country, in England, French Revolution, all of these things had tax grievances really as a core part of the, of the, um, of the process and the, uh, as a source of uh, discontent. <clears throat> but it's also the case that um, it, when you look more closely at these stories, there's almost always something else as well. Uh, there's some other source of discontent. So, Taxation causes trouble, but it may not be the really, it's come because it's a kind of a focal point, a point that people focus on for their discontent when there are other, other sometimes even deeper uh, sources of, uh, of unhappiness and unrest. And we know this is still true. There are books that try to catalog tax revolts throughout history. Uh, one has, I think, 391. But of course, as, try, as, you, as soon as you try to list tax revolts, you're going to be out of date because there are always more. We know that um, Colombia, France, Chile, we've, we've had uh, uh, issues in, in the recent past. And one of the themes of the book is to, is to look at some of the ways in which governments have tried over the years to achieve this fairness. And there have been really a fascinating, uh, almost bewildering range of things they've done. So 
in my own country, for example, and in France, we've had taxes that are explicitly related to your social class. So when you have an aristocracy, for example, you can vary the tax payable by the category of the aristocrat. So dukes may pay a different amount from earls. You can carry that down through the social spectrum. Um, has some attractions in some ways, taxation by social class, because you would think that no one is going to want to pretend to be of a lower social category uh, than they truly are. There have been uh, efforts achieving tax by, um, by regional quota, and this has actually been a very common way of raising tax throughout history. That is, you essentially, the, the central ruler essentially says, well, I want this much money from this region. I don't particularly care how you get it. I'm going to empower the local elites to collect this tax. In some sense, I'm going to uh, rely on the local elites to know something about who's well off and who isn't, and to levy the tax in a way that uh, is broadly acceptable, because the, the local elite know the politics better than I, as a central ruler, do. So it's almost, uh, you know, in some sense, in those days, all taxation was local, because it very much came down to the local elites uh, raising revenue, meeting a, a target that was fixed by a central government. Um, and you can see that to some extent, for example, today in the, um, <clears throat> in the European Union, where uh, essentially member states are presented with a, with a bill, how much money to raise, various elements, but in part it says, well, we want this much money from the member states, you can uh, choose how you're gonna raise it. Uh, so there's still this element of taxation by a regional quota. There have been efforts to tax by self-assessment, by which I mean these schemes, for example, for property, where, you, where the government says, well, each taxpayer is going to declare the value of their property. They're going to pay tax on that. Um, but the trick is that um, the government is going to have the right to buy the property at the price you declare or close to it or, or whatever. So in some sense, it's trying to give a, an incentive to declare uh, tax uh, property values accurately. And again, our understanding, we'd be happy to hear more or be corrected, is that this was tried, uh, for example, in Bogota with some success at some point. It hasn't been done much in history. It's a bit of a puzzle, why not? Um, but that's one example we cite that, uh, that we think is quite interesting. And as we'll see later, governments have tried to use all kinds of proxies to tax things that are correlated with uh, economic well-being or wealth. Sometimes, however, things go pretty wrong. And that brings us to back to my own country again, the, the UK, where 600 years apart, we managed to get things disastrously wrong in terms of the perceived fairness of the tax system. So the first time we got it wrong was in 1380, <clears throat> when a government, a very unpopular government, really in real trouble, uh, the war with the French was going badly, a lot of discontent, um, imposed uh, what was called a poll tax, that is a fixed amount per individual, though we'll come back to a little bit of detail on that in a moment, so uh, imposed a poll tax that led to um, the closest I think my country ever came to complete bloody revolution. Um, peasants marched on London, beheading officials and others along the way. Um, eventually, one of the great um, dramatic episodes of, of British history, the rebels confront the very young 14 year old king in London. Uh, he very bravely goes out to face them uh, he does concede to their demands, um, and they go over the, the uh, peasants go away very happy. But uh, as kings do, the next day he changed his mind, he reneged on their deal, and uh, the slaughtering went the other way. So that was 1380. Uh, 600 years later, we have another poll tax episode. You may know the saying of Marx that um, history, you know, history does repeat itself. The first time is tragedy, second time is farce. Well, 1989 was the farce episode. This was Mrs. Thatcher's government, again imposed a poll tax, uh, something the British governments had avoided very carefully for the previous 600, 600 years, for good reason. Mrs. Thatcher went ahead, and that led to very large non-compliance riots in Trafalgar Square quite something for a country that really has quite good tax compliance, and it led to the end of, of Mrs. Thatcher. One interesting footnote to the comparison between 1380 and 1989 was that the 1380 poll tax was actually uh, had a curious and interesting feature. 
Although it was levied as a fixed amount per individual, there was explicitly in the legislation an expectation that the rich would help the poor to pay their tax bills. So it goes back a little bit to this idea of taxing by community that I mentioned before. It was really a community charge. They counted the number of people, applied the tax rate to that, but basically expected rich people to help out the poor. And there are some villages where that's exactly what happened, where the local lord, where the local, you know, the, head, the top guy in the local community actually paid the poll tax for uh, others, for the poorer people. So it wasn't really a poll tax. You might call it more a community charge. The irony being that Mrs. Thatcher called her tax a community charge, but it really was a poll tax because there wasn't any of this expectation that the poor that the poor would be helped out by the rich. So we see my own country gives dramatic illustrations of how things go wrong. Just to add also briefly that in each case, there was something else going on. Sorry, Joel, uh, there's something else going on. So as I mentioned in 1380, there was a lot of discontent, even apart from taxation. Um, for example, we had just a few decades before we'd had the Black Death, which uh, wiped out a large part of the labor force that actually led to huge pressure for increased wages later in the century that was repressed by the government, all kinds of legislation to keep wages at pre-Black Death levels. Mrs. Thatcher, there were all kinds of other things going on. This was the era of privatization, taking on the power of the trade unions. So to the earlier theme, taxation becomes the focal point rather than the sole uh, cause of, of discontent. And we have the two pictures Joel began to show us. Here is poor old Watt Tyler, the leader of the revolt in 1380. And you can see what his fate was. He is the guy uh, about to lose his head. And then we have the tearful Mrs. Thatcher uh, leaving uh, number 10 Downing Street um, after the uh, poll tax uh, fiasco. And then I think I hand back to Joel for one of his favorite stories. Yes, um, thanks, Mick. One of my favorite stories. This is um, a South American um, episode. It's, this is a painting of the Queen Emma Bridge in Curacao, where, which was erected by the American ambassador in 1888. And to finance it, um, he proposed what looked like a progressive uh, scheme of tolls. Uh, how did one implement a progressive toll back in 1888? Well, the idea wasn't crazy. You had to pay the toll if you were wearing shoes or boots, but you could cross for free. This is a walking bridge. You could talk uh, cross for free if you were barefoot, with the idea being it is well-off people who wore shoes and boots. Uh, but this attempted progressivity was thwarted by the fact that apparently many poor people were so prideful, they didn't want to admit they were poor. They would borrow shoes to cross the bridge, maintaining their pride, but costing them the toll. And many rich people were not so prideful that they, and they would uh, hide their shoes or boots before they crossed, sacrificing their pride, but saving the toll. One reason this is a favorite story of mine is I learned about it on a cruise of the Caribbean in honor of my mother's 80th birthday. And those of you who have been on cruises will know that they put in your uh, birth uh, something about the places you're about to visit. And when we were about to visit Curacao in the material was this story. And even though this was 20 years ago, I remember thinking someday when Mick and I write a book, we have to put this in the book. And we did. Okay, we're on to the third part, which is about how taxes change behavior and what history tells us about the existence of excess burden. Taxes change behavior sometimes purposely, sometimes taxes change behavior inadvertently in ways government wish didn't happen. So we begin by talking about taxes purposely to change behavior. And our first story is about Emperor Peter the Great of Russia, who in the end of the 17th century decided to westernize the country to make it more like England and France. And one thing he noticed was that in Russia, 
uh, the nobles had these big beards. And in England and France, they didn't. And so, of course, it's not the most important uh, reform he instituted, but one that fits our story very well. He put an annual tax on beards. If you were a noble, for example, if you went out in public and had a beard, you would on the if you didn't uh, show uh, a token that you had to pay to get that you had uh, paid your beard tax, you were subject to substantial penalties. This is a tax not meant to raise a lot of revenue. It's meant to change people's behavior to get most, not necessarily all, of the nobles to shave their beards. One side of this token you got when you paid your tax, it said the beard is a superfluous burden, which is really great language for a modern public finance class. And on the other side, this is what it looked like. It said, I have paid my beard tax. Now, um, why put a tax on beards rather than just say, no one is allowed to have a beard? And the answer might be an efficiency argument that by putting a tax on beards, those nobles who really, really valued having a beard for whatever reason would keep their beard and pay the tax. For everybody else, they would pay the tax and shave their beard. The efficiency argument being that the tax differentiates among uh, the bearded, those who valued their beard a lot and those who valued it not so much. And so the lesson, of course, is that sometimes the objective of a tax is to change behavior. In history, sometimes this has a very sinister purpose, sometimes a laudable purpose, sometimes something in between, I guess, with Peter the Great. Um, we, in the book, tell stories about taxes on believers in disfavored religions, raising the question of how the government verified what uh, people believed in their hearts. We talk about 18th and 19th century England when there were taxes on newspapers and on newsprint, which opponents took to calling taxes on knowledge. Modern day uh, taxing smoking uh, is a good example where many people favor these taxes because because of its ability to dissuade people, particular youth, from taking up smoking. And this being a good example of how the intent to change behavior comes to get mixed up with the revenue, so much so that we talk in the book about governments who have come to rely so much on the revenues from taxing smoking that they become uh, less willing to pursue anti-smoking initiatives. And an example from Latin America is the uh, tax on sugary drinks in Mexico. Mexico being known for the last time I looked, the highest per capita consumption of sugary drinks. Another one of our favorite examples, which leads to another South American story is the tax on bachelors, which goes back to ancient Greece and Rome, but which lasted in the US till the 20th century where some states still had such a tax. You can think about why that's not a terrible idea, maybe for fairness reasons. Bachelors have a higher ability to pay because they have no family to support. Or maybe it's to change behavior, to encourage marriage. Our story we like is that some countries with bachelor taxes realize that it seemed a little unfair to put a tax on a young man who tried to get married but just couldn't persuade a woman uh, to agree. And in these countries, there was an exemption from the bachelor tax. If the bachelor could prove he had asked a woman to marry him, but had been rejected. Well, those of you who study tax avoidance may see what's coming next. Apparently in Argentina, uh, during this time, there arose what were called professional lady rejectors. That is, women who for a fee, would sign a document saying you had asked them to marry you and they had refused. So you got an exemption from the bachelor tax. 
and they got their fee. Of course, this is these days taxes with a designed to change behavior that has negative externalities is a central part of uh, public finance, Pigouvian taxes. If you set the tax rate e equal to the marginal social harm, you induce people to consider that harm in making their decisions. And of course, uh, many, maybe most economists support such taxes on carbon fuels, on driving on congested roads, and for positive externalities, subsidies to things like basic research and development and, re and recycling. This issue of taxes versus regulation came up during the pandemic where <laughs> the idea of putting a tax on antisocial behavior, such as not being vaccinated and going in public without a mask just isn't practical. And regulation with penalties is certainly the more practical uh, way to, to deal with that issue. Okay, so those are some examples of taxes designed to change behavior. Modern public finance also puts a lot of effort into thinking about taxes where inadvertently taxes change behavior and for which there's a social cost. And we introduced this topic by talking about the English tax on windows, which may sound like a crazy tax base. It lasted a century and a half and actually isn't so crazy. Why was there a tax on windows? Well, the English, as Mick was talking about, were seeking a way to have a tax whose burden varied according to the value of houses and therefore varied according to the wealth of the owner. And before Zillow.com, which is the American uh, website to find out how much your house, house is worth, what could you do? Well, what's a, an indicator of house value? Well, they first try to tax on fireplaces. The grander the house, the more the fireplaces, not so stupid. But the problem with that is the tax inspector had to go inside the house to verify the number of fireplaces. That sounds a little intrusive. What's another indicator of house value where you don't have to go inside? Well, windows. And so for a century and a half, there was a tax in England on homeowners based on the number of windows the house had. And what was the impact on behavior? Well, uh, you can still see that uh, impact if you go to Britain today, you can still see dwellings, resi um, buildings, which clearly had windows once and were later bricked up. And uh, there's a lot of evidence that the bricking up happened to reduce tax liability. This is an example of unintended, socially costly behavioral response to taxes. Another one is when jurisdictions put property taxes on based on the width of the street facing facade, which is another easy to measure in unobtrusive tax base, which is at least correlated with how grand the house is, but it's also bound to induce behavioral response. In this case, it wasn't bricked up windows. It was narrow, long houses. In Vietnam, these houses are known as rocket houses and they look like this. This is a photo from Vietnam. Remember the property tax is based on the width of the street facing facade. In this case, the two rocket houses look to have about 10 feet of tax base, but you can tell that the floor space is a lot bigger than you might expect from a house with a 10 foot tax base. So these are examples of what we now call excess burden. They're the economic cost incurred when taxes cause changes in behavior. Okay, we admit that bricked up windows and skinny houses are probably not a big fraction of GNP. We tend to study things like reduced labor supply or investment because of taxes. But that's a difficult concept to convey. And it's a difficult concept to measure, of course, because to know how much labor supply or investment 
change because of taxes, you need to know how much there would have been if it weren't for taxes, the counterfactual. And we have clever econometric methods to get at that. But we think that skinny houses and bricked up windows give a vivid visual sense of what excess burden is. Because we know what houses should look like. They shouldn't have bricked up windows. They shouldn't be so narrow and deep. So when we teach, and I understand many of you in the audience teach uh, taxation and public finance, when we try to convey the concept of excess burden to our students, we put this up on the slide where D plus E is the Harburger Triangle. It's a, an approximation of excess burden. That is, we have to admit, fairly dry. This is more vivid, and I will explain in a second why this, what this has to do with excess burden. It has to do with excess burden because in the 16th century, the British crown put a tax on peasants dogs because they didn't want dogs interfering with their hunting. And, and because of that, they had an exemption. There was no tax on dogs, which were no good for hunting. And it was thought that dogs without tails would be useless for hunting and so were exempt. What happened? Peasants started to cut their dog's tails. And by the time the tax was repealed, people had gotten used to seeing certain breeds of dogs without tails. And to this day, some dogs are known without tails. Now this is maybe one of our favorite stories, the problem is it seems not to be true. There are two world experts in taxes on dogs. Both we contacted both of them and said, hey, we find this story all over the internet. We don't see it in your writing, is it true? And they both said they don't think it's true. So we kept it in the book. We kept it in our slides because it's the most vivid example of excess burden we can think of, but warning, probably not true. Okay, uh, part four is about evasion and enforcement. And Mick, um, I don't have the slides numbered, so I want you to just jump in when it's your turn, okay? All right, I don't think it's quite yet. Tax evasion has been around as long as taxes have been around. We know that because there's a Sumerian tablet from 4,000 years ago that talks about a man for receiving smuggled goods. We have a papyrus from almost 3000 years ago, which records that an old man transferred his property to his sons at a nominal price to lower inheritance tax, which sounds like a very modern way to evade taxes. And we also know there, have, there has been discovered an ancient Egyptian frieze that looks like this. Well, what is this? This is a frieze depicting a, a tax, convicted tax evader about to be punished. That's the convicted tax evader is tied um, to the pole in the center of the frieze. And the gentlemen at each end are about to whip him. And that, we put the arrow, red arrows in. They're obviously not in the frieze um, because if you didn't look closely, you might think those two gentlemen on the ends are about to play a flute? No, they're about to whip the convicted tax evader. Uh, the problem with tax evasion for the purposes of our book, which is trying to make tax concepts vivid, is that tax evasion itself is generally not visible or visibly arresting. You know, think about non-filing. What great picture depicts somebody not filing a tax return? More vivid than evasion itself is tax enforcement, which we talk a lot about in the book. For example, the Egyptian tax evader being whipped. There are many good stories about, um, or horrible stories as well, about uh, enforcing tax evasion. Uh, in the 15th century, Vlad the Impaler in what is now Romania assaulted a, a town that was resisting his taxes, set the town on fire and impaled many of its inhabitants. This is an example we think of taking the stick part of enforcing tax a little bit too far. Vlad 
in Paris was, was known as Vlad the Impaler. Um, Argentina, we know, has used drones to monitor property taxes, more technological savvy than horrible uh, as Vlad the Impaler. Uh, we talk a little bit about the carrots used to enforce tax, which are not nearly as widespread as the sticks. A city in Argentina paved the sidewalks for randomly selected tax compliant households. And since 2012, another carrot, Pakistan has provided a what's called the taxpayer privileges and honor card to the tax remitting top remitting 100 taxpayers. And in Pakistan's case, one of the benefits is you, got a, you get a special uh, line at uh, customs and immigration if you're one of these folks. And one of, our, uh, one of my graduate students is Pakistani, took this picture at Lahore Airport to show line number 10, only for taxpayers, privilege, and honor card holders. And he took the picture in part to show that there was no one on this line. You could go right to the head of the line. And there were at least plenty of people in the other lines. OK, Mick, now I think it's you. That's right. Yeah, so um, so carrying on with the, the theme that, um, as you'll gather, we like pictures. We like to have images. Um, and um, avoidance lends itself to lots of great pictures and stories. Um, as Joel was saying, we've seen a couple already. But um, there are plenty of other examples of um, types of tanks avoidance that you can that make very manifest the kind of dead weight loss and distortions that, that Joel was talking about. So just to mention a couple, we have many in the book. <clears throat> so Chile at one point had a tax uh, <clears throat> or such a discrimination between cars and panel trucks that um, you can guess what happened. The panel trucks became more and more car-like in terms of uh, having some windows added, seats put in the back. There's a whole series of stories about ships over the centuries. Ships actually make a, one of the things that recur quite a lot in the history of taxation. And here's one example in the next uh, in the next slide. This was what's called, um, I'm not sure the pronunciation, a Fluit, F-L-U-Y-T, which was a Dutch ship of the 17th and um, mainly the 17th, early 18th century. And basically the Dutch had a tax on ships that was levied on the size of the deck, the deck area. So you can see this ship really has quite a small deck, but to make sure you have a, a, a to carry a lot of, you can carry a lot of cargo. If you imagine looking head on at this ship, it actually looks very bowed out like that. It's very narrow at the top with a thin, given a thin tax base, but then it becomes very bowed out, very, very broad at the waterline. And um, that turns out actually to be a very good way to build ships. So one of the reasons that the, the Dutch Seaborne Empire was so successful is said to be the design of this ship. So this may be a rare instance where uh, a tax uh, innovation, a tax induced product innovation actually turned out to be a, an, an improvement over what would otherwise have been there. Not quite, not wholly clear, but that's what some people say. Another example of, of uh, ship taxes, just to, to go back to, to a moment more on the ship tax. Uh, the other extreme is in my own country, Britain. So in the 19th century, as you, as you probably know, we had a very powerful Navy. It was said that you know uh, the British Navy ruled the world. Well, that may have been true, but at the same time, we had a tax on our merchant ships, our cargo carrying ships, that uh, gave a tax incentive for them to be very thin, to be very deep, very thin. And that turns out to be a very bad way to design ships. So while the Royal Navy was ruling the waves, in fact, too much of the merchant Navy, the, the cargo carrying ships, were actually underneath the waves. The British merchant ship, merchant shipping had a kind of, was kind of the laughing stock of, uh, of sailors around the world uh, due to this uh, um, uh, inappropriate, uh, unfortunate design of the tax system. Many other examples, now if we go on, many of these examples, of course, come out of um, the problems that arise when you have some kind of tax differentiation that requires you to draw a line between saying, okay, this product is taxable, this one is not. All these kind of line drawing episodes, uh, as we know, give rise to uh, tax uh, induced innovation of various kinds. You try to mimic the low tax, low tax thing in a way that nonetheless preserves some of the key attributes of the high tax things. So for example, 
when we have to be, we have to be very careful how we define cigarettes for purpose of, uh, of uh, taxing tobacco. And as we'll know that if you don't uh, define what a cigarette is a proper, properly, and you have a tax that is per cigarette, you're gonna end up with very big cigarettes as with this uh, smiling gentleman holding his super huge cigars in, in the picture. Um, so that's a party cigars uh, is an example, but there are plenty of others. We tell the story of the Japanese uh, treatment of uh, alcoholic drinks by malt content. But one of the biggest examples, of course, is the treatment of debt and equity, which we know is still a major problem in many countries and gives rise to um, uh, essentially trying to disguise equity type instruments as debt, uh, as well as giving an, an incentive to use debt rather than equity in ways that may <clears throat> jeopardize financial stability. So line drawing issues underline a lot of these uh, avoidance possibilities that we look at and show pretty pictures of. I think we turn next to uh, say a little bit about tax administration. And you know we're all used to the idea now that tax administrations are kind of bureaucracies, well, part of the government um, uh, mechanism. Of course, the history of tax administration is much richer than the kind of organizations we see now. As I was mentioning before, many taxes that have been related to, intended to be related to well-being, to wealth in some sense, have often been administered by local elites. <clears throat> That's essentially been, say, the history of how the current income tax, even in the UK, is administered. Um, the, these judgments on well-being were delegated to local, uh, local elites, trustworthy, presumably, or hopefully local elites. Many transaction-based taxes, on the other hand, were subject to collection by tax farming. So that's a system where essentially the government, in the simplest case, the government simply sells the right to collect taxes. Uh, it's, it accepts uh, offers to collect taxes. That gives the government a fixed amount. And then the private enterprise goes out and collect taxes according to the rules set by the government. And its profits are the excess of what it collects over what it has paid to the government. So this is kind of no longer, there are still some traces of this we can see around the world, and we talk about that in the book. But um, even uh, more generally, it provides, we think, some lessons about outsourcing bureaucratic organizations of tax administrations. How do you create good incentives for tax, tax administrations, which is still, uh, we think, a, a big issue in many parts of the world. But we tell to the story of the, um, the most famous instance of tax farming, which was in France prior to the revolution. Um, and the tax farmers became a very powerful, influential group, included people like uh, Antoine Lavoisier, uh, one of the early serious chemists. Um, so they became very powerful, influential people. Um, but uh, after the revolution, they were arrested for defrauding the state, put on trial. And you can probably guess how in 1793 trial of uh, rich and uh, um, despised people would go in France. Well, here it is. The one, the tax farmers who had not had the good fortune or the good sense to leave the country uh, ended up uh, on the guillotine, uh, Antoine Lavoisier among them. So we talk a little, that gives us a cause to talk about incentives in tax administration, quite a lot in the book. We also use um, some examples from the past to illustrate some basic principles of good tax administration. One of which is the idea that large taxpayers are really important. So the example goes back to uh, the UK, early 18th century, large problem, social problem of excessive uh, consumption of gin. And in an early example of using taxes more to change behavior than to collect revenue, the government imposed uh, various taxes on the consumption of gin, but nothing really happened to the consumption of gin. It kept increasing the, in the, ta increase the tax rate and nothing much happened. But then things changed in 1743. What happened? Well, the government realized that, well, in these previous taxes, we've been levying the tax at the retail stage. And there are thousands and thousands of gin retailers. I think in London, parts of one little area of London alone, there were 12,000 retailers. So you can imagine trying to tax them was really just not going to work. What, really, what uh, the realization in 1743 was that, well, let's tax the wholesalers instead. And there are only about 12 or so of those in London. So let's levy the tax on that at that point. And from there, again, you know, there were other things going on, but there's clear evidence that from that point on, the, the tax began to work. Consumption did uh, start, to, uh, start to decline. 
And that we use to illustrate the more general principle that really for tax administration, getting the money from big businesses is really going to be, is really critical. And that in many ways, nature is very kind to tax administrators in usually concentrating the tax base, including withholding and other sorts of taxes, the VAT, uh, concentrating the tax base in a relatively small number of, of taxpayers. And Joel has written on the uh, possible universality of a rule that something like the very largest businesses can give you 85% of your revenue, which is something I think that Joel finds is true in India as, a, as, in, the, as in the United States. So we also talk about tax administrators. We want to make the point that tax administrators are people too. Uh, we have to think about them. And history is full of people who are famous, but famous for the, not for being tax collectors, although at some point in their lives, they did have uh, roles in tax, uh, well, they were tax administrators. So we have, for example, Cervantes, um, author of uh, Don Quixote and others, was at some point a tax administrator, not, it seems, a terribly successful one. Tom Paine, the American agitator and um, uh, a radical writer. Chaucer, Voltaire, Herman Melville, author of um, Moby Dick. Even Adam Smith, ironically, was a customs official. So these are people who uh, became famous, that, but they didn't become famous because they were tax administrators. There is though one person we mentioned who did become famous for being a essentially being a tax administrator. And he's a fascinating guy. He was, this was a, a gentleman called Robert Hart, who left Northern Ireland as a young lad, went to China in really turbulent times during all the Taiping Rebellion through to the, to the Boxer Rebellion, he was there living through it all. And he really turned the Chinese Imperial Customs Service into a really world-class organization, uh, notably uh, corruption-free, efficient. And he became very much admired by his Chinese uh, counterparts so that when the Empress uh, of China theoretically resigned, retired and she was to honor 100 civil servants for their contributions to China, uh, Robert Hart uh, was the only foreigner, and he was, I think, also number three in the list. So he was very highly respected, played a large role more generally in China's modernization efforts at the time, and is one of the few tax administrators, possibly the only one, who got a, tax, uh, got a statue as a recognition for his services as a tax administrator. So there he is. So all of us here who are in, into tax administration, we should be aspiring to have our own statue like Robert Hart. It's not there anymore, sadly, but uh, he, not, he not only had a statue, he had a novel written about his life. Uh, the novel is not actually about customs administration because he had a very uh, interesting and guilt-ridden love life while in China. But I'm here, we're here to say he was quite a guy and uh, reading about his life is, uh, is really... Um, actually quite inspiring in many ways for what the, the kind of things that one can achieve through being a, a diligent tax administrator. I guess a general theme of the book is also that tax administrators uh, have often in history been unsung heroes of, uh, of um, building civilization. You know, if taxes are the price we pay for civilization, quiet tax administrators have had a, a lot of responsibility for, for that. And then back to Joel to wind us up, I believe. The last part of the book is about uh, politics. We understand that economists, for better or worse, don't write tax laws. And so tax laws have to survive uh, the political system. And in the last part of the book, we talk about that and try to collect the lessons we've learned from the previous four parts so that we have time for questions. I'll go uh, just talk for a few minutes about this. We talk about um, successes and failures. We view the spread of the value-added tax as a success story of taxation. We think the US income tax reform of 1986 is another example. It's sort of more fun to talk about the failures. Many of the failures uh, come about because the political system is not immune to being taken over by special interests. In the US, a great example is what happened when margarine was introduced, uh, this is the mid 19th century, it was invented. And when it came to the US, you can guess what special interest was not happy. That was the dairy industry because margarine was a competitor 
of butter, the dairy industry first tried to regulate margarine by, for example, saying it had to be dyed pink. And eventually they settled on taxes and there were many US states had taxes on margarine for decades. Um, Lady Godiva is probably known to all of you what uh, her naked walk through Coventry, what many of you may not know is that her naked walk was uh, because she, when it was trying to persuade her husband who was the Lord of Coventry to reduce taxes. Uh, she, uh, he said, if you care so much about that, show me um, how much you care and uh, ride naked through town, which she did. And he fulfilled his promise and abolished uh, the heavy taxes Godiva opposed. And we talk about the role of taxation in the movement to get women to vote. We have examples both from the US and the UK. In the US, uh, the famous suffragette Susan B. Anthony uh, asserted the duty of property holding women to refuse to pay taxes when they were not represented in legislatures. And in the UK, Clements Houseman, um, and here's a picture of Clements Houseman demonstrating in rainy London uh, for women, the right of women to vote. And you can see on the left, their sign, no vote, no tax. And in the upper right is the logo of this movement, no vote, no tax. Well, that's what we have. Uh, we thank you for your uh, attention. Um, we have a website that will be available soon where you can read more about follies and wisdom. You can tell us weird and wonderful tax stories that we might not have known about. And I'll turn it back over for questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael Schroeder. For the for this fascinating presentation, I think that is really it's, it's a very good class. <laughs> it's a very good class. It's, it's really good to 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 give some classes about taxation. Let me let me start with with one question um, regarding the future. It seems difficult to imagine the future of taxation without going through the post pandemic agenda. No, that's it's, it's a, it's, I know that this is it's, it's a hot topic right now, the post-pandemic agenda, or, or, or a kind of commonplace, actually. The pandemic crisis has put pressure on public finance in two ways. No? On, on one hand, requiring greater public intervention through the provision of goods and service to, to, to face the emergency. On the other hand, with a significant, a significant decrease in, in tax revenue, through the, the decrease in, 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 in activity level in, in the GDP. Looking in long term, we are probably facing a Peacock and, and Weizmann displacement effect, no? as an explanation of a new and higher step, no? a new and higher step on, of government spending. You have a good, really good chapter called Welfare and Welfare in your book about this effect. So the government needs to find additional revenue sources to finance this new step of public expenditure. That's a global problem, I know. But in the Latin American regions, these this problems have greater dimension, we think. The post-pandemic scenario would be a good moment to review tax bases that have historically been underutilized and in some cases have expanded considerably during the pandemic. That is where we are now in the region. We are reviewing the property taxation, you know, proper property, wealth taxes, taxes on inheritance, on digital activities, selective taxation on the consumption of, of, uh, of sins, you know, pollution, pollution activities, unhealthy consumption, alcohol, cigarettes, sugary drinks, fuel, non-returnable plastic, reviewing the tax regimes for the extractive sector as they have strongly increased their prices in the last month. But the, the, the high level of, of the fiscal gap in the region, we estimate 
in the, the uh, fiscal deficit for central government uh, uh, about 7% of deficit for the central government only uh, to be addressed in our countries is makes all these measures appear as necessary but maybe not sufficient conditions to 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 to, to finance this 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 gap um, in this context the role of taxation on the previous tax would not only be a collection no but would make a valuable a valuable contribution in distributive terms excuse me because i, I lost my 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 last <laughs> And, and social legitimacy and social legitimacy and political support for other adjustment to the tax system that would be necessary to fill the large existing file fiscal gap i don't know if you, this is clear this maybe is it's not only a collection problem but also a problem of legitimacy and, and political support taking it into account the history of social conflicts related with inequality government intervention and taxation in the region, 2019 Chile, 2021 Colombia. Uh, the question is, what tell the, the story, what tell us the history of taxation and your experience on how to achieve a broad consensus on the level of intervention to face this increase in public expenditure, its financing, and how to distribute the, 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 the tax burden? This is the question. You want me to start, Joel, or do you want to go? You go. Okay. Well, just a just a couple of um, thoughts from me. No, they're very clearly very relevant, um, very difficult questions. Um, as you say, we have, uh, in a way, the pandemic. We had we had. We had issues enough going into the into the pandemic in terms of concerns about inequality, climate issues, uh, revenue shortfalls in in many countries, even after the after the the great financial crisis, the global financial crisis. Um, one thing we talk about in the book is um, one of the lessons of history is that when one looks at uh, periods in which the tax system has become most progressive, has become strongly progressive. It's often been after, in particular after wars, where essentially what has happened is that most of the burden, the hardship of the war has been borne by the less well off. It's the less well off that get, um, get conscripted, get sent off to fight, um, you know, suffer the, the injuries and so on. Um, and there's a, there's been a notion at various points in history that, well, there's a social consensus that we really need to kind of share the burden more effect more fairly that this was a kind of a collective um, problem that we were addressing but the burden for fell on particularly the, the some of the most vulnerable less well off and those are the periods particularly after wars where you see particularly very high progressive tax rates the most progressive income taxes and income tax rates have been in this kind of situation where there's a some kind of consensus that we the rich really need to do their bit to do their share to help share the burden that's fallen mostly on uh, the more vulnerable people and i think there is a question you could make very similar arguments about the pandemic that the burden of the pandemic has really been borne primarily by and still is borne by the less well-off more vulnerable and actually some of the some of the least vulnerable people have done pretty well out of the out of the pandemic in terms of, uh, of finances. So it's a kind of um, probably an open question as to whether we are going to see in in countries this kind of um, pulling together a notion that the tax system has to serve its role in uh, sharing the what, what has been a you know very burdensome experience for many to share that burden rather more fairly than it's being shares, shared at, 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 the, at the moment. So we're thinking, you know, so this brings in issues about um, forms of solidarity tax. We know there are other examples where countries have had some kind of national emergency and they've levied taxes on a progressive basis to try to meet the, the needs. I'm thinking about uh, the cost of reunification in Germany or some of the natural disasters that um, in Japan, for example, has had these solidarity taxes to try to, to, uh, to pay for uh, the, the, the kind of the, the common cost. Um, so I think there is a kind of an open question as to whether 
societies are going to feel this kind of um, uh, necessity to, to explicitly share the burden a little bit more through the, through the tax system. I think we see some of that in some countries already, um, maybe not as one might, um, maybe not as much as perhaps one might have, have expected. But in on terms of your distributional issue, I think as well as, uh, you know, the standard questions about, well, you know, how do we, how do we maybe make the VAT more productive in many countries at the same time as protecting the poor? I think there is this overarching question of whether social attitudes will really change as a consequence of the pandemic. I'm, I'm, I don't think we're, we're very sure about that. I think the other related element maybe that I would mention is that I think a number of the cases you mentioned, uh, you know, you'll think about extractive industries when they benefit from high uh, uh, resource prices, think about some companies that have done very well during the crisis. I think maybe this is going to make us think a little bit more directly about uh, how we tax excess profits, how we have um, uh, taxes on rents of various kinds. And maybe just going back to my previous point, uh, after both world wars, <clears throat> uh, all, more or less, or during more or less both world wars, all, I think all the major powers involved in both world wars, except I think Germany in the second, had explicitly excess profit taxes. They explicitly introduced taxes to try to reach uh, profits in excess of a, of a normal return. And they raised huge amounts of revenue by this way. I think in both the US and the UK, by the end of the First, first World War, Second World War, about you know, a quarter to one third of all revenue was coming from excess profit taxes. But I think more generally, sorry, I'll, 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 here I'll finish. It, it suggests that we need to think a little bit more carefully about how we tax rents. I think the last few years we've become kind of obsessed with this taxation of multinationals, but we haven't really thought that much about the basic design of the corporate tax and whether that does a good job at taxing these kind of rents uh, of the kind that I think you you have in mind, one uh, one Pablo. But um, so I've spoken too long. I don't know, Joel. Did you, do you want to? Yeah, let me just add that um, I think Mick uh, very nicely explain the general context, but how, it, how these issues are resolved depends on the political context, depends on the country. In the US, as many of you probably know, the Biden administration has proposed significant tax increases, but only on uh, corporations and on individuals who are wealthy, who earn over $400,000 a year. So that's quite consistent with um, what happens after conflicts, wars, or in this case, COVID. But I will say as of today, the political prospects of those proposals are really uncertain. Um, the Biden administration proposed to give the IRS a lot more resources to crack down on evasion by high income people. As of now, that proposal is at best dormant and maybe dead and um, Many of the other parts of this of these proposals have very uncertain political prospects. Thank you, you both. Let me. I have a second a second question, I, and it's more related with with our issue with local finan financing and intergovernmental. Uh, uh, um, uh, fiscal relations. In the second part of the book, in, in, in Winners and Losers, uh, that is a really good, really very interesting part of the book. In the chapter, there is one chapter that is called Taxing by Community. You explain the evolution, and you talk in the presentation too, of quota arrangement as a way of raise taxes from subnational tax base. In our vision, the need to mobilize greater revenues at the subnational level too will mean an increase in territorial inequalities because the tax bases are unevenly, unevenly distributed among territories. No, are really very unevenly distributed. To the extent that one of the objectives is to reduce inequality, the question is how you suggest to address the, this growing territorial inequalities. About, uh, to, to, we, we have to work in reallocation tax responsibilities. We have, to, we have to put greater emphasis 
on the on the equalization this, uh, on intergovernmental equalization transfer a, a combination could could you tell us uh, uh, pros and cons of these different possibilities Mick, I think this is yours. Okay, well, I can. Yeah, it's a well, it's a very big question, and I think your your you point out that the issue is very clearly. I think even when we think about these taxation by regions in in the past, where the central government sets quotas, um, uh, you're quite you know they have to, one of the issues is always the adjust was always historically the adjustment of quotas between the different areas because you can imagine that you know different areas did differently some prospered and some uh, prospered less uh, so readjusting the quotas between countries between sort of regions for example in with the land tax in 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 the UK, in England was always a very politically contentious uh, contentious topic I think well bringing uh, up in terms of how people think about things these days. I think, I think we have fairly good ideas of which taxes uh, are well suited for being at lower level governments and which are at uh, best suited high level governments. I think, as you say, we know we, we think that property tax works well as a, as a local government tax. We think that, <clears throat> that um, um, you know, pr issues with where there are where mobility issues are more of a concern, we want to leave the taxing powers uh, to the to the centre. Um, you know, maybe with some relatively modest, say, add-ons to the income tax, maybe at, at regional uh, local level. Um, particular issues about the VAT, of course, being operated at, at subnational levels, which um, in some countries, some parts of the region, are, are clearly big issues. But I think at the end of the day, <clears throat> one has to, you know, there has to be some scope for revenue sharing if we believe that there are good reasons why we want to allocate particular taxes to particular levels and there are various um, limits to what can be achieved at local level i think we have to think about um, schemes of, of regional revenue sharing of various kinds then you get into what the institutions are for doing that and um, i'm sure you know more about these things than me but for example in india we have the national finance commission every few years to think about these issues, which seems to work uh, work relatively well. So my, my overall sense is that, you know, we have we have a bit of a conventional wisdom about which taxes should allocate be allocated to which governments, um, which I'm at least fairly comfortable with. But then that does, you're right, lead to issues of revenue sharing, what the institutions would be for revenue sharing, possibly what kind of common, what kind of rules do you set for lower level governments? So if you give the lower level government some uh, control over business taxes? Do you want to impose minimum rates uh, to avoid mutually damaging tax competition? <clears throat> Might you even want maximum rates to prevent tax exporting? So I think the answer is, is a fairly, um, become, does become a, a somewhat institutional one in terms of how you build trustworthy and effective organizations for resolving what you say are very often very heated and difficult um, conflicts of interest across the across the regions. Uh, let, let me uh, just br very briefly add a, uh, a recent episode from the US, which was about both uh, COVID and intergovernmental relations. So there were large transfers from the federal government to state governments as part of um, the COVID initiative. And um, the rule said that uh, state governments could not use the revenue to lower their own state tax rates. And if I remember correctly, three Republican uh, uh, dominated states threatened to sue on the grounds of uh, uh, inappropriate meddling in uh, state decision making of that provision. Thank you. I have um, some questions in the, in the chat. Um, Vicente Fretes Civils ask you, what are the lessons from history to reconcile the effort to tax the, I'm sorry, to, hmm? the, uh, the efforts to tax the few wealthy business and individuals and their capacity to lobby to avoid being taxed? 
we talk a lot about um, taxing big business. In fact, we have, and we talk uh, particularly about uh, efforts to tax multinationals. In fact, we have a whole chapter about uh, the history of taxing multinational governments, their uh, clever attempts uh, to reconstitute their affairs um, to avoid the taxes. Um, what, um, so can you repeat the pr uh, precise question about big businesses? Yeah, he said that what are the lessons from history to reconcile the, the efforts to tax the few wealthy business and, individu and individuals and their capacity? Okay. And their capacity well, I, for me, lobby, I would say to lobby to avoid uh, being taxed. Yeah. So. Okay. So I would say one of the biggest lessons is that. Uh, wealthy individuals and big corporations have tremendous resources to both um, avoid taxes, and by avoid, I mean legal means to avoid it. And any legislation uh, that attempts to raise more revenue in this way should really carefully consider the enforcement issues, um, put them in place, and think them through before changing uh, the tax code. Uh, about lobbying, oh, we have plenty of stories about lobbying. I told the story about um, uh, the uh, lobbying of the dairy industry to uh, keep margarine out of the United States. Uh, we also have a story which has relevance for today about how in the 1930s, US states started to implement taxes on chain stores. Uh, the kind of local mom and pop businesses saw the chain stores making big uh, headway into local markets. And sure enough, the political strength of the local businesses uh, helped get these chain store taxes. Uh, the modern analogy is uh, uh, the mom and pop uh, brick and mortar uh, businesses in the US and I imagine everywhere, seeing the Amazons of the world uh, taking a lot of their business and taxes. Um, is one of the lobbying efforts uh, these stores, uh, these interests have made. Let me add a, yeah, <clears throat> just to add a couple of, of, of um, thoughts on lessons. I think um, one, one lesson is that there's nothing new in the wealthy and well-advised um, avoiding and evading taxes. I think, I can't remember what, where exact, which part of the ancient world it's from, Joe, but we have a story about, um, is it from ancient Sumer, I think, where somebody was avoiding inheritance tax by transferring their assets at a notional price to their, uh, to their descendants. So these tricks go back um, centuries, even the multinational, we talk about the Vesti brothers operating in Argentina and other countries were avoiding tax um, they were using transfer pricing, uh, deferral, inverting, all these things more than 100 years ago. So one lesson is, yeah, the rich are pretty good at it, have been forever. Uh, I think the other one that we talk about among the lessons for the book is this whole issue of international cooperation, because a lot of these uh, tricks obviously operate inherently across borders. So there is a, you know, there is a question, well, really is tax sovereignty a thing of the past for many nations, even more than we've come to perhaps um, think about more seriously in the current G20 OECD discussions. But I think um, clearly it's addressed many of these problems uh, in taxing the wealthy um, and large profitable businesses. These are really coordination problems as much as anything. And although we've made progress, I think the jury is still out uh, on whether we've really uh, come close to cracking that uh, that problem, whether we have the will to crack that problem, given, as Joel says, all the lobbying that uh, that surrounds these things. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Mick. Uh, Javier Suarez Pandielo, you raise your hand. OK. Yes, uh, um, I have two, two questions and, and a joke. <laughs> Two questions uh, uh, from the debate about uh, fiscal issues now in Spain. Uh, uh, what, what do you think about the, the, the future of the comprehensive income tax? Uh, the, the question is, uh, if you, you have the, the talking and in the 
book is uh, you 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 destinate uh, so many pages to 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 write about uh, equity uh, and, and so, so uh, uh, lastly uh, the idea is the uh, separate the the uh, income from work and the income from capital uh, most of my countries are going to to this way uh, we are thinking about the the, the, the possibility of of, of uh, comeback and, and, and go to a comprehensive uh, uh, tax um, such as uh, an, uh, a dollar or an euro has the same uh, capacity uh, from uh, as also from other. Uh, what do you think about, about this? The second question is in, in relation uh, well, we, we, we are an, an association uh, from local governments, from, from decentralization. No? And, and, and now you, you, you know that uh, in Spain and in other countries, there are some process uh, of uh, secession, uh, even the, well, um, when the, the, the richest uh, regions um, Want, uh, don't want to pay taxes for the uh, for the poorest uh, ones, and so uh, what do you think about about this? The, the, the fiscal competence uh, uh, among regions, you think it's a good idea to to excite the, the competence uh, among regions or or, or not? No? And, and and the joke the joke is um, well I, I remember a joke from from one of your your um, uh, examples no is the imposto de soltería imposto de soltería uh, there was a, a tax on single men uh, on single people uh, in Portugal uh, and the question is. Uh, how how we can avoid the, the tax no and in the in, in uh, with the the dictatorship of uh, salazar president salazar uh, there was uh, a, a tax of on, on single people in in portugal and uh, well uh, tax collector, a uh, bureaucrat, was to a uh, small village in Alentejo, eh, in a poor uh, region of Portugal, uh, to require a single person to pay uh, the, 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 the tax, no? the tax, and say, well, you, you were not uh, paid the, the, the tax, the, the strategy of the a farmer to, to, to don't pay is to say, well, um, President Salazar, President Salazar is a single people, is a single person. You have required the, 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 the tax to President Salazar, uh, the, the answer of the, of the bureaucrat was, uh, well, President Salazar, no, President Salazar is not a single person. Wow. President Salazar is a single person. I know. No, 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 no. President Salazar is married with the nation. <laughs> Very. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you for that story. If we'd known about it, we would have put it in the book. Uh, <laughs> if we ever write a second edition, uh, I'm sure we will put it in the book. Yeah. So let me quickly take your your questions. I, I can't add anything to that joke other than to recall that we, in the first draft, we had a story from Romania about the bad sort tax, which some readers objected to that it was not quite for a, a family book. So we took it out. If anyone's interested, maybe we can <laughs> tell it by email. Uh, okay, so your second question was about secession and um, you're uh, really not going to be able to entice me into talking about Catalonia uh, in this webinar. But uh, other than mentioning, of course, um, tax and generally the fiscal um, uh, deficit or surplus a region has relative to other regions can be quite, uh, quite an important issue. We, 
uh, in the in the U.S. we had the Civil War, which was um, some people argue uh, an important cause of which was the economic differences between the South and the North. Um, uh, let me say more about the uh, future of the comprehensive income tax, your first question. Um, I think the comprehensive income tax will remain the centerpiece of uh, most countries' uh, intent to, to raise taxes in a progressive way. Uh, in the US, uh, the proposals of the Biden administration are to strengthen the progressivity of the income tax by revisiting the taxation of capital gains. In my view, it is the preferential tax of capital gains which shackles the ability of income taxes to uh, be progressive because capital gains are largely um, a phenomenon of the very rich. And um, there are uh, fundamental changes proposed by the Biden administration in how we tax capital gains. The political prospects of which again are very uncertain. Thanks, nothing, no, nothing, nothing really to add from me. Although I must say as um, being British, your question about secession and tensions uh, has really come, is coming to the fore after Brexit, which has unleashed, I think, all kinds of tensions between um, the constituent countries of the UK that uh, haven't yet, I think, uh, risen to the prominence. They probably will have, and I'm sure tax will be part of that. We know Scotland already has some of its own taxing powers, but I think uh, these these are issues that, um, that are obviously highly political, um, but I can see more of those <laughs> heading my way as a, as, a, as a British subject. Nothing really to add also on the, on, the, on the comprehensive income tax. I think I agree with Joel. I think this whole issue of um, strengthening capital income taxes before one necessarily thinks about wealth taxes is, a, is an important one. Um, but just to say in the book, we don't particularly push, we don't particularly push our own, um, our own tax theme. So I, um, uh, our own tax, pet tax schemes, <clears throat> but we sort of set out some of the issues. And I think, uh, you know, you raise, you raise some key issues, but I have little to add to what, to Joel's great answer. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know, Annabella, if we have any, any, any question, any additional question? So thank you to the authors and the participants for this enchanting conference. Uh, I think that's maybe the best way to, to to finish our conference and seminar season. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, Mr. President Javier Suarez Pandielo, the, the Zoom is yours right now. Well, I, I, I suppose you agree uh, that I was not lying to you when I announced uh, at the beginning of the session that we were going to learn by enjoying. Uh, so I only want to close the session, thanking from, uh, I feel, all of you uh, for, uh, for your participation, especially for uh, Mike, uh, Joel, and Juan Pablo, and uh, remembering and sitting you for the 10th Ibero-American Conference on Local Financing uh, that we will develop uh, unfortunately, once again, virtually uh, between August 13 and September 2, uh, organized this year by IFIL, by the IDEB, the CEPAL, and the Georgia State University. As usual, all the information about the event uh, can be found in, in our web. And uh, well, thank you, thank you very, very, very much uh, for, for this um, Excellent uh, session, and uh, see you in other occasion. I hope so. Well, thank you to you too. Gracias, muchas gracias. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank it's been fun. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And next time you are going to speak in Spanish, Joel. We we, yes. we, we can we can no listen problem. you in Spanish. Perfectamente. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very All much. Right. Thank you. Have a bye good bye. day. Thank you.